From the Conference Center Theater in Salt Lake City, Utah, this is the Sunday morning session of the 190th Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music for this session is provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Henry B. Eyring, second counselor in the first presidency of the church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the Sunday morning session of the 190th semiannual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Russell M. Nelson, who presides at the conference, has asked me to conduct this session. We extend our love and greetings to those of you who are participating in these proceedings throughout the world by radio, television, the internet, or satellite transmission. We acknowledge members of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles who are seated on the rostrum this morning. The music for this session, which was previously recorded, will be provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square under the direction of various conductors and organists. The choir opened this meeting with Awake and Arise, and will now favor us with Press Forward Saints. The invocation will then be offered by Elder Randall K. Bennett of the Seventy, after which the choir will sing If the Savior Stood Beside Me.
Our loving Heavenly Father, we love Thee, and we are deeply grateful for Thy great plan of happiness. We love Thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and are profoundly grateful for His atonement. Help us to hear Thy Son. Father, as we hearken to and heed the word of Thy prophet and Thine apostles, please bless President Russell M. Nelson. We love him and sustain him. We pray, Father, that Thou wilt fill our hearts with more love for Thee and Thy Son, Thy prophet and Thine apostles, and all of Thy children. Please bless all those who suffer in sorrow. Father, help us to more lovingly minister to those in need, those all around us. We pray that we might more fully engage in and participate in thy work of salvation and exaltation. We pray for thy spirit now and always as we seek to do thy will and say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. With the announcement yesterday of Elder L. Whitney Clayton being released as a General Authority 70 and being granted emeritus status, we note that he has also been released as a member of the Presidency of the 70. Elder Brent H. Nielsen has been called as a member of the Presidency of the 70. 
and we propose that he be sustained. All in favor, please manifest it. Any opposed, please indicate. We will now be pleased to hear from President M. Russell Ballard, acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Sister Lisa L. Harkness, first counselor in the primary general presidency, and Elder Ulysses Suarez of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. My dear brothers and sisters, during the last week of his mortal ministry, Jesus taught his disciples to watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Among the things that shall come to pass before his second coming are wars and rumors of wars, famines and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. In the Doctrine and Covenants, the Savior said, And all things shall be in commotion, for fear shall come upon all people. Certainly we live in a time during which things are in commotion. Many people fear the future, and many hearts have turned away from their faith in God and His Son, Jesus Christ. News reports are filled with accounts of violence, moral denigration, as published online. Cemeteries, churches, mosques, synagogues, and religious shrines have been vandalized. A global pandemic has reached virtually every corner of the earth. Millions of people have been infected over, and millions have a million have died. School graduations, church worship services, marriages, missionary service, and a host of other important life events have been disrupted. Additionally, countless people have been left alone and isolated. Economic upheavals have caused challenges for so many, especially for the most vulnerable of our Heavenly Father's children. We have seen people passionately exercising their right to peaceful protest, and we have seen angry mobs riot. At the same time, we continue to see conflicts all around the world. I think often of those of you who are suffering, worried, afraid, or feeling alone. I assure each one of you that the Lord knows you, that He is aware of your concern and anguish, and that He loves you intimately, personally, deeply, and forever. Each night when I pray, I ask the Lord to bless all who are burdened with grief, pain, loneliness, and sadness. I know that other Church leaders echo the same prayer. Our hearts individually and collectively go out to you, and our prayers go to God in your behalf. I spent several days last year in the northeastern part of the United States, visiting American and church history sites, attending meetings with our missionaries and our members, and visiting government and business leaders. On Sunday, October 20th, I spoke to a large gathering near Boston, Massachusetts. As I was speaking, I was prompted to say, I plead with you to pray for this country, for our leaders, for our people, and for the families that live in this great nation founded by God. I also said that America and many of the nations of the earth, as in times past, are at another critical crossroads and need our prayers. My plea was not in my prepared remarks. Those words came to me as I felt the Spirit prompt me to invite those present to pray for their countries and their leaders. 
Today, I expand my call for prayer to all people from every country around the world. No matter how you pray or to whom you pray, please exercise your faith, whatever your faith may be, and pray for your country and for your national leaders. As I said last October in Massachusetts, we stand today at a major crossroads in history, and the nations of the earth are in desperate need of divine inspiration and guidance. This is not about politics or policy. This is about peace and the healing that can come into individual souls as well as to the soul of countries, their cities, towns, and villages through the Prince of Peace and the source of all healing, the Lord Jesus Christ. During the past few months, I have had the impression come to me that the best way to help the current world situation is for all people to rely more fully upon God and to turn their hearts to Him through sincere prayer, humbling ourselves and seeking Heaven's inspiration to endure or conquer what is before us will be our safest and surest way to move confidently forward through these troubling times. The scriptures highlight prayers offered by Jesus, as well as his teachings about prayer during his mortal ministry. You'll remember the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This focus, beautiful prayer, repeated often throughout Christianity, makes it clear that it is appropriate to directly petition our Father, which art in heaven, for answers to what is troubling us. Therefore, let us pray for divine guidance. I invite you to pray always. Pray for your family. Pray for your leaders of nations. Pray for the courageous people who are at the front lines in this current battle against social, environmental, political, and biological plagues that impact the people throughout the world, the rich and the poor, the young and the old. The Savior taught us to not limit who we pray for. He said, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. On the cross of Calvary, where Jesus died for our sins, he practiced what he taught when he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Sincerely praying for those who may have be considered our enemies demonstrates our belief that God can change our hearts and the hearts of others. Such prayers should strengthen our resolve to make whatever changes are necessary in our own lives, families, and communities. No matter where you live, what language you speak, or the challenges you face, God, God hears and answers you in His own way and in His own time. Because we are His children, we can approach Him to seek help, solace, and a renewed desire to make a positive difference in the world. Praying for justice, peace, the poor and the sick is often not enough. After we kneel in prayer, we need to get up from our knees and do what we can to help those both of ourselves and as we help others. The scriptures are full of examples of people of faith who combine prayer with action to make a difference in their own lives and in the lives of others. 
In the Book of Mormon, for example, we read about Enos. It has been observed that about two-thirds of his short book describes a prayer or a series of prayers, and the balance tells what he did in consequence of the answers he received. We have many examples of how prayer made a difference in our own church history, beginning with Joseph Smith's first vocal prayer in a wooded clearing near his parents' log home in the spring of 1820, seeking forgiveness and spiritual direction. Joseph's prayer opened the heavens. Today we are the beneficiaries of Joseph the prophet and other faithful Latter-day Saint men and women who have prayed and acted to help establish the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I often think of the prayers of faithful women like Mary Fielding Smith, who with God's help courageously led her family from mounting persecution in Illinois to safety in the valley where her family prospered spiritually and temporally, temporally. After praying earnestly on her knees, she then worked hard to overcome her challenges and bless her family. Prayer will, prayer will lift us and draw us together as individuals and families, as a church and as a world. Prayer will influence scientists and help them toward discoveries of vaccines and medications that will end this pandemic. Prayer will comfort those who have lost a loved one. It will guide us in knowing what to do for our own personal protection. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to redouble your commitment to prayer. I urge you to pray in your closets, in your daily walk, in your homes, in your wards, and always in your hearts. On behalf of the leaders of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I thank you for your prayers for us. I urge you to continue to pray that we may receive the inspiration and revelation to guide the Church through these difficult times. Prayer can change our own lives. Motivated by sincere prayer, we can improve and help others to do the same. I know the power of prayer by my own experience. Recently, I was alone in my office. I had just gone through a medical procedure on my hand. It was black and blue, swollen, and it was painful. As I sat at my desk, I could not focus on the important critical matters because I was distracted by this pain. I knelt in prayer and asked the Lord to help me focus so that I could accomplish my work. I stood and returned to the pile of papers on my desk. Almost immediately, clarity and focus came to my mind, and I was able to complete the pressing matters before me. The world's current chaotic situation may seem daunting as we consider the multitude of issues and challenges but it's my fervent testimony that if we will pray and ask Heavenly Father for needed blessings and guidance, we will come to know how we can bless our families, neighbors, communities, and even the countries in which we live. The Savior prayed, and then he went about doing good by feeding the poor, providing courage and support to those in need, and reaching out in love, forgiveness, peace, and rest to all who would come unto him. He continues to reach out to us. I invite all church members as well as our neighbors and friends of other faith groups worldwide to do as the Savior counsel his disciples. Watch ye therefore and pray always for peace 
for comfort, for safety, and for the opportunities to serve one another. How great is the power of prayer, and our <clears throat> and how needed are our prayers and faith in God and His beloved Son in the world today. Let us remember and appreciate the power of prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. When our children were young, our family spent a few days at a beautiful lake. One afternoon, some of the children put on life jackets before jumping off a deck and into the water. Our youngest daughter watched with hesitation, carefully observing her siblings. Then, with all the courage she could muster, she plugged her nose with one hand and jumped. She immediately popped up and, with a bit of panic in her voice, yelled, Help me! Help me! Now, she was not in any mortal danger. Her life jacket was doing its job and she was floating safely. We could have reached out and pulled her back on the deck with little effort. Yet, from her perspective, she needed help. Perhaps it was the chill of the water or the newness of the experience. In any case, she climbed back onto the deck, where we wrapped her in a dry towel and complimented her on her bravery. Whether we are old or young, many of us have, in moments of distress, uttered with urgency words such as, help me, save me, or please answer my prayer. Such an event happened with Jesus' disciples during his mortal ministry. In Mark, we read that Jesus began again to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude. The crowd became so numerous that Jesus entered into a ship and spoke from its deck. All day long he taught the people in parables as they sat on the shore. And when the evening was come, he said unto his disciples, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they departed from the shore and were on their way across the Sea of Galilee. Finding a spot in the back of the ship, Jesus lay down and quickly fell asleep. Soon there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was nearly full of water. Many of Jesus' disciples were experienced fishermen and knew how to handle a boat in a storm. They were his trusted, indeed his beloved disciples. They had left jobs, personal interests, and family to follow Jesus. Their faith in him was evident by their presence in the boat. And now their boat was in the middle of a tempest and on the very verge of sinking. We don't know how long they battled to keep the boat afloat in the storm, but they woke Jesus with a bit of panic in their voices, saying, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Lord, save us, we perish. They called him Master, and that he is. He is also Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of heaven and earth, the creator of all things from the beginning. From his position in the boat, Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the raging sea, Peace, be still. And the wind did cease, and there was a great calm. Ever the master teacher, Jesus then taught his disciples through two simple yet loving questions. He asked, Why are ye so fearful? Where is your faith? There is a mortal tendency, even a temptation, when we find ourselves in the middle of trials, troubles, or afflictions, to cry out, Master, carest thou not that I perish? Save me. Even Joseph Smith pleaded from an awful prison, O God, where art thou? And where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? Certainly the Savior of the world understands our mortal limitations, for he teaches us how to feel peace and calm, even when the winds blow fiercely around us and billowing waves threaten to sink our hopes. 
to those with proven faith, childlike faith, or even the smallest particle of faith, Jesus invites, saying, Come unto me, believe on my name, learn of me and listen to my words. He tenderly commands, Repent and be baptized in my name. Love one another as I have loved you, and always remember me. Jesus reassures, explaining, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I can imagine that Jesus' disciples in the storm-tossed boat were, of necessity, busy watching the waves crash onto their deck and bailing out the water. I can picture them handling the sails and trying to maintain some semblance of control over their little craft. Their focus was on surviving the moment, and their plea for help was urgently sincere. Many of us are no different in our day. Recent events around the globe and in our nations, communities, and families have buffeted us with unforeseen trials. In times of turmoil, our faith can feel stretched to the limits of our endurance and understanding. Waves of fear can distract us, causing us to forget God's goodness, thus leaving our perspective short-sighted and out of focus. Yet it is in these rough stretches of our journey that our faith can be not only tried, but fortified. Regardless of our circumstances, we can intentionally make efforts to build and increase our faith in Jesus Christ. It is strengthened when we remember that we are children of God and that He loves us. Our faith grows as we experiment on the Word of God with hope and diligence, trying our very best to follow Christ's teachings. Our faith increases as we choose to believe rather than doubt, forgive rather than judge, repent rather than rebel. Our faith is refined as we patiently rely on the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah. While faith is not a perfect knowledge, Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, it brings a deep trust in God whose knowledge is perfect. Even in turbulent times, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is gritty and resilient. It helps us sift through unimportant distractions. It encourages us to keep moving along the covenant path. Faith pushes through discouragement and allows us to face the future with resolve and squared shoulders. It prompts us to ask for rescue and relief as we pray to the Father in the name of His Son. And when prayerful pleas seem to go unanswered, our persistent faith in Jesus Christ produces patience, humility, and the ability to reverently utter the words, Thy will be done. President Russell M. Nelson has taught, quote, we do not need to let our fears displace our faith. We can combat those fears by strengthening our faith. Start with your children. Let them feel your faith even when sore trials come upon you. Let your faith be focused on your loving Heavenly Father and His beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Teach each precious boy or girl that he or she is a child of God created in His image with a sacred purpose and potential. Each is born with challenges to overcome and faith to be developed." End quote. I recently heard two four-year-old children share their faith in Jesus Christ when they responded to the question, How does Jesus Christ help you? The first child said, I know Jesus loves me because He died for me, and He also loves grown-ups. The second child said, He helps me when I'm sad or grumpy. He also helps me when I'm sinking. Jesus declared, Therefore, whoso repenteth and cometh unto me as a little child, him will I receive, for of such is the kingdom of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Recently, President Nelson promised that decreased fear and increased faith will follow as we begin anew truly to hear, hearken to, and heed the words of the Savior. Sisters and brothers, our current challenging circumstances are not our final eternal destination. As members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we have taken upon us the name of Jesus Christ by covenant. We have faith in His redeeming power and hope in His great and precious promises. We have every reason to rejoice, for our Lord and Savior is keenly aware of our troubles, cares, and sorrows. And, as Jesus was with His disciples of old, he is in our boat. I testify he has given his life so that you and I will not perish. May we trust him, obey his commandments, and with faith hear him say, Peace, be still. In the sacred and holy name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. In his poetic hymn of praise, the psalmist declared, O Lord, thou hast searched me and know me. Thou knowest my down-seating and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. In this poem's semantic parallelism, the psalmist praises the Lord's divine attribute of omniscience because he truly knows every aspect of ourselves. Being aware of all that is necessary for us in this life, the Savior invites us to seek Him in every thought and follow Him with all our heart. This gives us the promise that we can walk in His light and that His guidance prevents the influence of darkness in our life. Seeking Christ in every thought and following Him with all our heart requires that we align our mind and desires with His. The scriptures refer to this alignment as standing fast in the Lord. This course of action implies that we continually conduct our lives in harmony with the gospel of Christ and focus daily on everything that is good. Only then we may achieve the peace of God which passeth all understanding and which will keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The Savior himself instructed the elders of the church in February 1831, Treasure these things up in our hearts, in your hearts, and let the solemnities of eternity rest upon your minds. Despite our continuous efforts to seek out the Lord, Inappropriate thoughts may penetrate our mind. When such thoughts are permitted and even invited to stay, they can shape the desires of our heart and lead us to what we will become in this life and eventually to what we'll, we will inherit for eternity. Elder Neil A. Maxwell once emphasized this principle by saying, Desires determine the degradations in outcomes including why many are called, but few are chosen. Our ancient and modern prophets have constantly reminded us to resist temptation in order to avoid losing our spiritual traction and becoming confused, disoriented, and disillusioned in life. Metaphorically speaking, yielding to temptation is like approaching a magnet with a metal object. The magnet invisible force attracts the metal object and holds it tightly. The magnet loses its power over it only when the metal object is placed far from it. Therefore, just as the magnet is unable to exercise power over a faraway metal object, as we resist temptation, it fades away and loses its power over our mind and heart, and consequently, over our actions. 
This analogy reminds me of an experience that a very faithful member of the church shared with me some time ago. This member told me that when she awakened on a particular morning, an improper thought that she never had experienced before unexpectedly entered her mind. Although it caught her completely by surprise, she reacted against the situation in a split second, saying to herself and to that thought, no, and replaced it with something good to divert her mind from the unwelcome thought. She told me that as she exercised her moral agency in righteousness, that negative involuntary thought immediately disappeared. When Mor Moroni called upon the people to believe in Christ and to repent, he urged them to come unto the Savior with all their hearts, stripping themselves from all uncleanness. Furthermore, Moroni invited them to ask God with unbreakable determination that they would not fall into temptation. Applying these principles in our lives requires more than a mere belief. It also requires adjusting our minds and hearts to these divine principles. Such adjustment requires a daily and constant personal effort, in addition to reliance on the Savior, because our mortal inclinations will not disappear on their own. Fighting against temptation takes a lifetime of diligence and faithfulness. But please know that the Lord is ready to assist us in our personal efforts and promises remarkable blessings if we endure to the end. During a particularly difficult time when Joseph Smith and his fellow prisoners in Liberty Jail did not have freedom in anything except for their thoughts, the Lord provided helpful counsel and a promise to them that are extended to all of us. Let thy bowels else be full of charity towards all men and women, and to the household of faith, and let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. Then shall thy confidence wax strong in the presence of God. The Holy Ghost shall be thy constant companion, and thy scepter an unchanging scepter of righteousness and truth. In doing so, holy thoughts will continuously adorn our minds, and pure desires will lead us to righteous actions. Moroni also reminded his people not to be consumed by their lusts. The word lust refers to an intense longing and improper desire for something. It encompasses any dark thoughts or evil desires that cause an individual to focus on selfish practices or worldly possessions, rather than doing good, being kind, keeping the commandments of God, and so forth. It is often manifested through the most carnal feelings of the soul. The Apostle Paul identified some of these feelings such as uncleanness, lasciviousness, hatred, wrath, strife, envy, and such like. Besides all the evil aspects of lust, we cannot forget that the enemy uses it as a secret and deceptive weapon against us when he tempts us to do something wrong. My beloved brothers and sisters, I testify that as we rely upon the rock of salvation, the Savior of our souls, and follow Moroni's counsel, <clears throat> our ability to control our thoughts will increase significantly. I can assure you that our spiritual maturity will grow at an increasing pace, changing our heart, making us more like Jesus Christ. Additionally, the influence of the Holy Ghost will be more intense and continuous in our life. Then the enemy's temptations, little by little, will lose their power over us, resulting in a happier and more pure and consecrated life. For those who, for whatever reason, fall into temptation and are dwelling upon unrighteous actions, I assure you that there is a way back, that there is hope in Christ. A few years ago, 
I had the opportunity to visit with a dear member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who went through a very difficult time in his life after committing a major transgression. When I first saw him, I could see a sadness in his eyes, accompanied by a brightness of hope in his countenance. His very expression reflected a humble and changed heart. He had been a dedicated Christian and had been richly blessed by the Lord. However, he had let a single improper thought invade his mind, with them led to others. As he steadily became more and more permissive to these thoughts, soon they took root in his mind and began to grow deep in his heart. He eventually acted upon these unworthy desires, which led him to make decisions against everything that was most precious in his life. He told me that if he had not given place to that foolish thought to begin with, he would not have become vulnerable and susceptible to the temptations of the enemy, temptations that brought so much sadness in his life, at least for a period of time. Fortunately, like the prodigal son in the famous parable found in the Gospel of Luke, he came to himself and woke up from that nightmare. He renewed his trust in the Lord and felt true contrition and had the desire to eventually return to the Lord's fold. That day, we both felt the Savior's redeeming love for us. At the end of our brief visit, we were both overcome <clears throat> with emotion. And to this day, I remember the resplendent joy in his countenance when he left my office. My dear friends, when we resist the little temptations, which often come unexpectedly in our life, you, we are better equipped to avoid serious transgressions. As President Spencer W. Kimball said, seldom does one enter into a deeper transgression without first yielding to lesser ones, which open the door to the greater. A clean field does not suddenly become weedy. While preparing to accomplish his divine mission on earth, the Savior Jesus Christ exemplified the importance of constantly resisting everything that might dissuade us from realizing our eternal purpose. After several unsuccessful attacks by the enemy, who attempted to divert him from his mission, the Savior categorically dismissed the devil by saying, Get thee hence, Satan. Then the devil liveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Can you imagine, my brothers and sisters, what would happen if we were to derive strength and courage from the Savior and say, no, and get thee hence to unvirtuous thoughts that very first moment they come into our minds? What would be the impact on the desires of our hearts? How would our resulting actions keep us close to the Savior and allow the continued influence of the Holy Ghost in our lives? I know that by following Jesus' example, we will avoid many tragedies and undesirable behaviors that might cause family problems and disagreements, negative emotions and inclinations, perpetrating injustices and abuses, enslavement by evil addictions, and anything else that would be against the Lord's commandments. In his historic and touching message from April this year, our dear prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, made a promise that all those who are willing to hear him, hear Jesus Christ, and obey his commandments, will be blessed with additional power to deal with temptations, struggles, and weakness, and that our capacity to feel joy will increase even during the increasing turbulence, current tur turbulence. I testify to you that the promises given by our dear prophet are the promises given by the Savior himself. 
I invite all of us to hear him in every thought and follow him with all our heart in order to obtain the strength and courage to say no and get the hands to all the things that might bring unhappiness into our life. If we do so, I promise that the Lord will send an added measure of His Holy Spirit to strengthen and comfort us, and we may become individuals after the Lord's own heart. I bear my witness that Jesus Christ lives, and that through Him we may triumph over the enemy's evil influences and qualify to live for eternity with Him and in the presence of our beloved Father in heaven. I testify of these truths with all my love for you and for our beautiful Savior, to whose name I give glory, honor, and praise evermore. I say these things in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We will now join the choir in singing, We Thank Thee, O God, for a Prophet. After the singing, we will hear from Elder Carlos A. Godoy of the Presidency of the Seventy. He will be followed by Elder Neil L. Anderson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. This is the Sunday morning session of the 190th Semi-Annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.
Brothers and sisters, I believe in angels, and I would like to share with you my experiences with them. In doing so, I hope and pray that we will recognize the importance of angels in our lives. Here are Elder Jeffrey R. Holland's words from a past general conference. Quote, when we speak of those who are instruments in the hand of God, we are reminded that not all angels are from the other side of the veil. Some of them we walk with and talk with here now every day. Some of them reside in our own neighborhoods. Indeed, heaven never seems closer than when we see the love of God manifested in the kindness and devotion of people so good and so pure that angelic is the only word that comes to mind." Close quote. It is about angels on this side of the veil that I want to talk. The angels that walk among us in, every, in our everyday lives are powerful reminders of God's love for us. The first angels that I will mention are the two sister missionaries who taught me the gospel when I was a young man, Sister Vilma Molina and Sister Ivone Chevic. My younger sister and I were invited to a church activity where we met these uh, two angels. I never imagined how much that simple activity would change my life. My parents and siblings were not interested in learning more about the church at that time. They were not even willing to have the missionaries in our home. So I took the missionary lessons in a church building. That small room in the chapel became my sacred grove. One month after these angels introduced me to the gospel, I was baptized. I was 16 years old. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of that sacred event, but I do have a picture of my sister and me at the time we participated in that activity. I may need to clarify who is who in this picture. <laughs> I am the taller one on the right. As you can imagine, Remaining active in the church was not challenging, was, a, was challenging for a teenager whose lifestyle had just changed and whose family was not taking the same path. As I was trying to adjust to my new life, a new culture, and new friends, I felt out of place. I felt alone and discouraged many times. I knew the church was true, but I had a hard time feeling part of it. While uncomfortable and uncertain as I tried to fit into my new religion, I found the courage to participate in a three-day youth conference, which I thought would help me make new friends. This is when I met another saving angel named Monica Brandão. She was new in the area, having moved from another part of Brazil. She quickly got my attention and luckily for me, accepted me as a friend. I guess she, was, uh, she looked at, at me more from the inside than the outside. Because she befriended me, I was introduced to her friends who then became my friends as we enjoyed many youth activities I attended later. Those activities were so critical to my integration into this new life. These good friends made a big difference, but not having the gospel taught in my home with a supportive family still put my ongoing conversion process at risk. My gospel interactions in the church became even more crucial to my growing conversion. Then, two additional angels were sent by the Lord to help. One of them was Leda Vettori, my early morning seminary teacher. Through her accepting love and inspiring classes, she gave me a daily dose of the good word of God, which was so needed throughout my day. This helped me to gain the spiritual strength to keep going. Another angel sent to help was the young man president, Marco Antonio Fusco. He was also assigned to be my senior home teaching companion. Despite my lack of experience and different appearance, he gave me assignments to teach in our preschool meetings and home teaching visits. He gave me the chance to act and to learn and not just be an observer of the gospel. He trusted me more than I trusted myself. Thanks to all these angels and many others I encountered during those important early years, 
I received enough strength to remain on the covenant path as I gained a spiritual witness of the truth. And by the way, that young angel girl, Monica, after we both submissions, she became my wife. I don't think it was coincidence that uh, good friends, church responsibilities, and nurturing by the good word of God were part of this, that process. President Hinckley wisely thought, quote, it is not an easy thing to make the transition incident to joining this church. It means cutting old ties. It means leaving friends. It, mean, it may mean sitting aside cherished beliefs. It may require a change of habits and a suppression of appetites. In so many cases, it means loneliness and even fear of the unknown. There must be nurturing and strengthening during this difficult season of a convert's life. Later, he added, every one of them needs three things, a friend, a responsibility, and nurturing with the good word of God. Why I'm sharing these experiences with you? First, it is to send a message to those going through a similar process right now. Maybe you are a new convert or coming back to the church after wandering around for a while or just someone struggling to fit in. Please, please don't, do not give up on your efforts to be part of this big family. It is the true church of Jesus Christ. When it comes to your happiness and salvation, it is always worth the effort to keep trying. It is worth the effort to adjust your lifestyle and traditions. The Lord is aware of the challenges you face. He knows you. He loves you, and I promise he will send angels to help you. In his own words, the Savior said, I will go before your face. I will be in your, in your right hand, on, and on your left, my spirit shall, shall be in your heart, and my angels round about you to bear you up. My second purpose for sharing these experiences is to send a message to all members of the church, to all of us. We should remember that it's not, an easy, it's not easy for new converts, returning friends, and those with a different lifestyle to instantly fit in. The Lord is aware of the challenge they face, and he's looking for angels willing to help. The Lord is always looking for willing volunteers to be angels in others' lives. Brothers and sisters, would you be willing to be an instrument in the Lord's hands? Would you be willing to be one of these angels? To be an emissary sent from God, from this side of the veil, for someone who is, he is worthy about? He needs you. They need you. Of course, we can always count on our missionaries. They are always there, the first ones to enlist for this angelical job, but they are not enough. If you look around carefully, you will find many in need of an angel's help. These people may not be wearing white shirts, dresses, or any standard Sunday attire. They may be sitting alone towards the back of the chapel or classroom sometimes feeling as if they are invisible. Maybe their hairstyle is a little extreme or their vocabulary is different, but they are there and they are trying. Some may be wondering, should I keep coming back? Should I keep trying? Others may be wondering if one day they will feel accepted and loved. Angels are needed right now. Angels who are willing to leave their comfort zone to embrace them. People who are so good and so pure that angelic is the only word that comes to mind to describe them. Brothers and sisters, I believe in angels. We are all here today, a giant army of angels set apart for, the, for these latter days to minister to others as extensions of the hands of a loving creator. I promise that if we are willing to serve, the Lord will give us opportunities to be ministering angels. He knows who needs angelic help, and he, will, and he will put them in our path. 
the Lord puts those who need angelic help on our path daily. I'm so grateful for the many angels that the Lord has put in my path throughout my life. They were needed. I'm also grateful for his gospel that help us to change and give us the chance to be better. This is a gospel of love, a gospel of ministry. Of this I testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I express my love for you, our beloved friends and fellow believers. I have admired your faith and courage during these past months as this worldwide pandemic has disrupted our lives and taken precious family members and dear friends. During this period of uncertainty, I have felt an unusual gratitude for my sure and certain knowledge that Jesus is the Christ. Have you felt that way? There are difficulties that weigh upon each of us, but always before us is he who humbly declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. While we endure a season of physically distancing ourselves from others, we need never endure a season of spiritually distancing ourselves from him who lovingly calls to us, come unto me. Like a guiding star in a clear, dark sky, Jesus Christ lights our way. He came to earth in a humble stable. He lived a perfect life. He healed the sick and raised the dead. He was a friend to the forgotten. He taught us to do good, to obey, and to love one another. He was crucified on a cross, rising majestically three days later, allowing us and those we love to live beyond the grave. With his incomparable mercy and grace, he took upon himself our sins and our suffering, bringing forgiveness as we repent and peace in the storms of life. We love him. We worship him. We follow him. He is the anchor of our souls. Interestingly, while this spiritual conviction is increasing within us, there are many on the earth who know very little of Jesus Christ. And in some parts of the world where his name has been proclaimed for centuries, faith in Jesus Christ is diminishing. The valiant saints in Europe have seen belief decline in their countries through the decades. Sadly, here in the United States, faith is also receding. A recent study revealed that in the last 10 years, 30 million people in the United States have stepped away from believing in the divinity of Jesus Christ. Looking worldwide, another study predicts that in the decades ahead, more than twice as many will leave Christianity than those who will embrace it. We, of course, revere the right of each to choose, yet our Heavenly Father declared this is my beloved son, hear him. I witness that the day will come that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Christ. How are we to respond to our changing world? While some are neglecting their faith, others are searching for the truth. We have taken upon ourselves the name of the Savior, what more are we to do? Part of our answer may come as we remember how the Lord tutored President Russell M. Nelson in the months prior to his call as president of the church. Speaking one year before his call, President Nelson invited us to more deeply study the 2,200 references of the name Jesus Christ listed in the topical guide. Three months later, in April General Conference, he spoke of how, even his in his decades of devoted discipleship, this deeper study of Jesus Christ had greatly affected him. Sister Wendy Nelson asked him about its impact. He replied, I am a different man. He was a different man 
At age 92, a different man? President Nelson explained, as we invest time in learning about the Savior and his atoning sacrifice, we are drawn to him. Our focus becomes riveted on the Savior and his gospel. The Savior said, look unto me in every thought. In a world of work, worries, and worthy endeavors, we keep our heart, our mind, and our thoughts on him who is our hope and salvation. If a renewed study of the Savior helped prepare President Nelson, could it not help prepare us as well? In emphasizing the name of the church, President Nelson taught, if we are to have access to the power of the atonement of Jesus Christ, to cleanse and heal us, to strengthen and magnify us, and ultimately to exalt us, we must clearly acknowledge him as the source of that power. President Nelson taught us that consistently using the correct name of the church, something that might seem like a small thing, is not small at all and will shape the world's future. I promise you that as you prepare yourselves as President Nelson, President Nelson did, you too will be different, thinking more about the Savior, speaking of him more frequently and with less hesitation as you come to know and love him even more deeply. Your words will flow more comfortably as they do when you speak of one of your children or of a dear friend. Those listening to you will feel less like debating or dismissing you and more like learning from you. You and I speak of Jesus Christ, but maybe we can do a little better. If the world is going to speak less of him, who is going to speak more of him? We are along with other devoted Christians. Are there images of the Savior in, your home, in our homes? Do we talk often to our children about the parables of Jesus? The stories of Jesus are like a rushing wind across the embers of faith in the hearts of our children. When your children ask you questions, consciously think about teaching what the Savior taught. For example, if your child asks, Daddy, why do we pray? You might respond, that's a great question. Do you remember when Jesus prayed? Let's talk about why he prayed and how he prayed. We talk of Christ. We rejoice in Christ. That our children may know to what source they may look for a remission of their sins. This same scripture adds that we preach of Christ. In our worship services, let us focus on the Savior Jesus Christ and the gift of his atoning sacrifice. This does not mean we cannot tell an experience from our own life or share thoughts from others. While our subject might be about families or service or temples or a recent mission, everything in our worship should point to the Lord Jesus Christ. 30 years ago, President Dallin H. Oaks spoke of a letter he had received from a man who said he had attended a sacrament meeting and listened to 17 testimonies without hearing the Savior mentioned. President Oaks then noted, perhaps that description is exaggerated, but I quote it because it provides a vivid reminder for all of us. He then invited us to speak more of Jesus Christ in our talks and class discussions. I have observed that we are focusing more and more on Christ in our church meetings. Let's consciously continue with these very positive efforts. With those around us, let us be more open, more willing to talk of Christ. President Nelson said, True disciples of Jesus Christ are willing to stand out, speak up, and be different from the people of the world. Sometimes we think that a conversation with someone needs to result in them coming to church or seeing the missionaries. 
let the Lord guide them as they are willing. While we think more about our responsibility to be a voice for him, thoughtful and open about our faith. Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf has taught us that when someone asks us about our weekend, we should be willing to happily respond that we loved hearing the primary children sing, I'm trying to be like Jesus. Let us kindly witness our faith in Christ. If someone shares a problem he or she has in their personal life, we might say, John, Mary, you know that I believe in Jesus Christ. I have been thinking about something he said that might help you. Be more open on social media in talking about your trust in Christ. Most will respect your faith, but if someone is dismissive when you speak of the Savior, take courage in his promise. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you for my sake, for great is your reward in heaven. We care more about being his followers than being liked by our own followers. Peter counseled, be ready always to give an answer for the hope that is in you. Let us talk of Christ. The Book of Mormon is a powerful witness of Jesus Christ. Virtually every page testifies of the Savior and his divine mission. An understanding of his atonement and grace saturates its pages. As a companion to the New Testament, the Book of Mormon helps us better understand why the Savior came to rescue us and how we can more profoundly come unto him. Some of our fellow Christians are at times uncertain about our beliefs and motives. Let us genuinely rejoice with them in our shared faith in Jesus Christ and in the New Testament scriptures we all love. In the days ahead, those who believe in Jesus Christ will need the friendship and support of one another. As the world speaks less of Jesus Christ, let us speak more of him. As our true colors as his disciples are revealed, many around us will be prepared to listen. As we share the light we have received from him, his light and his transcendent saving power will shine on those willing to open their hearts. Jesus said, I come as a light into the world. Nothing lifts my desire to speak of Christ more than visualizing his return. While we do not know when he will come, the events of his return will be breathtaking. He will come in the clouds of heaven, in majesty and glory, with all his holy angels, not just a few angels, but all his holy angels. These are not the cherry-cheeked cherubim painted by Raphael found on our Valentine cards. These are the angels of the centuries, the angels sent to shut the mouths of lions, to open prison doors, to announce his long-awaited birth, to comfort him in Gethsemane, to assure his disciples at his ascension, and to open the glorious restoration of the gospel. Can you imagine being caught up to meet him, whether on this side or the other side of the veil? That is his promise to the righteous. This amazing experience will mark our souls forever. How grateful we are for our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, who has lifted our desire to love the Savior and proclaim his divinity. I am an eyewitness to the Lord's hand upon him and the gift of revelation that guides him. President Nelson, we eagerly await your counsel. 
My dear friends across the world, let us talk of Christ, anticipating his glorious promise, whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father. I testify he is the Son of God in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We are grateful to the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square for the beautiful music that has been provided this morning and to those who have spoken to us thus far. The choir will now favor us with God is Love. The concluding speaker for this session will be our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. Following his remarks, the choir will close this meeting by singing, For I am called by thy name. The benediction will then be offered by Elder Walter F. Gonzalez of the Seventy.
my dear brothers and sisters, how grateful I am for this marvelous, for the marvelous messages of this conference, and for my privilege to speak with you now. For the more than 36 years, I've been an apostle. The doctrine of the gathering of Israel has captured my attention. Everything about it has intrigued me, including the ministries and names of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their lives and their wives, the covenant God made with them and extended through their lineage, the dispersion of the 12 tribes, and the numerous prophecies about the gathering in our day. I have studied the gathering, prayed about it, feasted upon every related scripture, and asked the Lord to increase my understanding. So imagine my delight when I was led recently to a new insight. With the help of two Hebrew scholars, I learned that one of the Hebraic meanings of the word Israel is let God prevail. Thus, the very name of Israel refers to a person who is willing to let God prevail in his or her life. That concept stirs my soul. The word willing is crucial to this interpretation of Israel. We all have our agency. We can choose to be of Israel or not. We can choose to let God prevail in our lives or not. We can choose to let God be the most powerful influence in our lives or not. For a moment, let us recall a crucial turning point in the life of Jacob, the grandson of Abraham. At the place Jacob named Peniel, which means the face of God, Jacob wrestled with a serious challenge. His agency was tested. Through this wrestle, Jacob proved what was most important to him. He demonstrated that he was willing to let God prevail in his life. In response, God changed Jacob's name to Israel, meaning, let God prevail. God then promised Israel that all the blessings that had been pronounced upon Abraham's head would also be his. Sadly, Israel's posterity broke their covenants with God. They stoned the prophets and were not willing to let God prevail in their lives. Subsequently, God scattered them to the four corners of the earth. Mercifully, he later promised to gather them. As reported by Isaiah, For a small moment have I forsaken thee, Israel, but with great mercies will I gather thee. With the Hebraic definition of Israel in mind, the gathering of Israel takes on added meaning. The Lord is gathering those who are willing to let God prevail in their lives. The Lord is gathering those who will choose to let God be the most important influence in their lives. For centuries, prophets have foretold this gathering, and it is happening right now. As an essential prelude to the second coming of the Lord, it is the most important work in the world. This premillennial gathering is an individual saga of expanding faith and spiritual courage for millions of people. 
and as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or Latter-day Covenant Israel, we have been charged to assist the Lord with this pivotal work. When we speak of gathering Israel on both sides of the veil, we are referring, of course, to missionary, temple, and family history work. We are also referring to building faith and testimony in the hearts of those with whom we live, work, and serve. Any time we do anything that helps anyone on either side of the veil to make and keep their covenants with God, we are helping to gather Israel. Not long ago, the wife of one of our grandsons was struggling spiritually. I will call her Jill. Despite fasting, prayer, and priesthood blessings, Jill's father was dying. She was gripped with fear that she would lose both her dad and her testimony. Late one evening, my wife, Sister Wendy Nelson, told me of Jill's situation. The next morning, Wendy felt impressed to share with Jill that my response to her spiritual wrestle was one word. The word was myopic. Jill later admitted to Wendy that initially she was devastated by my response. She said, I was hoping for grandfather to promise me a miracle for my dad. I kept wondering why the word myopic was the one he felt compelled to say. After Jill's father passed on, the word myopic kept coming to her mind. She opened her heart to understand even more deeply that myopic meant nearsighted. And her thinking began to shift. Jill then said, quote, myopic caused me to stop, think, and heal. That word now fills me with peace. It reminds me to expand my perspective and seek the eternal. It reminds me that there is a divine plan and that my dad still lives and loves and looks out for me. Myopic has led me to God. Close quote. I'm very proud of our precious granddaughter-in-law. During this heart-wrenching time in her life, dear Jill is learning to embrace God's will for her dad with an eternal perspective for her own life. By choosing to let God prevail, she is finding peace. If we will allow it, there are many ways this Hebraic interpretation of Israel can help us. Imagine how our prayers for our missionaries and for our own efforts to gather Israel could change with this concept in mind. We often pray that we and the missionaries will be led to those who are prepared to receive the truths of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. I wonder, to whom will we be led when we plead to find those who are willing to let God prevail in their lives? We may be led to some who have never believed in God or Jesus Christ, but who are now yearning to learn about them and their plan of happiness. Others may have been born in the covenant, but have since wandered away from the covenant path. They may now be ready to repent, return, and let God prevail. We can assist them by welcoming them with open arms and hearts and some to whom we may be led may have always felt there was something missing in their lives. 
they too are longing for the wholeness and joy that come to those who are willing to let God prevail in their lives. The gospel net to gather scattered Israel is expansive. There's room for each person who will fully embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. Each convert becomes one of God's covenant children, whether by birth or by adoption. Each becomes a full heir to all that God has promised the faithful children of Israel. Each of us has a divine potential because each is a child of God. Each is equal in his eyes. The implications of this truth are profound. Brothers and sisters, please listen carefully to what I'm about to say. God does not love one race more than another. His doctrine on this matter is clear. He invites all to come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female. I assure you that your standing before God is not determined by the color of your skin. Favor or disfavor with God is dependent upon your devotion to God and his commandments and not to the color of your skin. I grieve that our black brothers and sisters during the, uh, the world over are enduring the pains of racism and prejudice. Today, I call upon our members everywhere to lead out in abandoning attitudes and actions of prejudice. I plead with you to promote respect for all of God's children. The question for each of us, regardless of race, is the same. Are you willing to let God prevail in your life? Are you willing to let God be the most important influence in your life? Will you allow his words, his commandments, and his covenants to influence what you do each day? Will you allow his voice to take priority over any other? Are you willing to let whatever he needs you to do take precedence over every other ambition? Are you willing to have your will swallowed up in his? Consider how such willingness could bless you. If you are unmarried and seeking an eternal companion, your desire to be of Israel will help you decide whom to date and how. If you are married to a companion who has broken his or her covenants, your willingness to let God prevail in your life will allow your covenants with God to remain intact. The Savior will heal your broken heart. The heavens will open as you seek to know how to move forward. You do not need to wander or wonder. If you have sincere questions about the gospel or the church, as you choose to let God prevail, you will be led to find and understand the absolute eternal truths that will guide your life and help you to stay firmly on the covenant path. When you are faced with temptation, even if the temptation comes when you are exhausted or feeling alone or misunderstood, imagine the courage you can muster as you choose to let God prevail in your life, as you plead with him to strengthen you. When your greatest desire is to let God prevail, to be part of Israel, so many decisions become easier. 
so many issues become non-issues. You know how best to groom yourself. You know what to watch and read, or to spend your time, and with whom to associate. You know what you want to accomplish, and you know the kind of person you really want to become. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, it takes both faith and courage to let God prevail. It takes persistent, rigorous spiritual work to repent and to put off the natural man through the atonement of Jesus Christ. It takes consistent daily effort to develop personal habits, to study the gospel, to learn more about Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, and to seek and respond to personal revelation. During these perilous times of which the Apostle Paul prophesied, Satan is no longer even trying to hide his attacks on God's plan. Emboldened evil abounds. Therefore, the only way to survive spiritually is to be determined to let God prevail in our lives, to learn to hear his voice, and to use our energy to help gather Israel. Now, how does the Lord feel about people who will let God prevail? Nephi summed it up well. The Lord loveth those who will have him to be their God. Behold, he loved our fathers, and he covenanted with them. Yea, even Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he remembers the covenants which he has made. Close quote. And what is the Lord willing to do for Israel? The Lord has pledged that he will fight our battles and our children's battles and our children's children's battles to the third and fourth generation. As you study your scriptures during the next six months, I encourage you to make a list of all that the Lord has promised he will do for covenant Israel. I think you will be astounded. Ponder these promises. Talk about them with your family and friends. Then live and watch for these promises to be fulfilled in your own life. My dear brothers and sisters, as you choose to let God prevail in your lives, you will experience for yourselves that our God is a God of miracles. As a people, we are his covenant children. And we will be called by his name. Of this I testify in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Our beloved Father in heaven, at the conclusion of this Sunday session, we express gratitude unto thee, gratitude for the music we just heard, gratitude for the messages that were given, gratitude for the inspired ideas, thoughts, feelings that have come to our minds and hearts during this session. We are grateful and we thank thee for a prophet who guides us, teaches us, invites us to gather Israel. We are especially grateful for thy beloved son, our beloved savior, our divine redeemer, our holy Messiah. And we pray for healing in this time, healing and comfort for those that are suffering. We pray for increased faith, hope, and love as we go through these unusual times. We pray thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray these things and express gratitude in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the Sunday morning session of the 190th Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music was provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited.